I'm John McAuliffe. Um, I coordinate the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Um, and I suspect all of you get our newsletter mailings. Um, we uh, have existed since 2014 when Tom Hayden, David Courtright and I put together a letter in protest of the uh, Pentagon's effort to <laughs> define the history of the war. Um, and we actually, the amazing thing of that for the first time in my life and only time in my life, I suspect, we got a front page story because the media themselves were so upset with the, what the Pentagon was doing. The Pentagon seems to have actually mostly shut down that project, though I think their uh, timeline is still up and I'm told it's been improved some, but is still problematic. It's not the same war we would remember. Um, so at any rate, we've been in existence. We did a very big conference in 2015 in Washington all of that is online at our YouTube channel. Um, and then we did a series of, of events around anniversaries, like the um, anniversary of the Pentagon March. And then came COVID and we, like everybody else, adopted and adapted. Uh, so we've been using since then um, the Zoom or webinar um, and it's been interesting. We're obviously get people from a far bigger geographical space than we would if we were meeting and doing conferences in Washington, which uh, was what the way things were being organized mostly. Um, and all of these things do go online. This one will go online in a day or two. Uh, and so our YouTube channel has got, uh, we hope, resources that will be available. Mm -hmm. How long will YouTube exist? <laughs> Probably longer than any of us exist um, in some form or another. And, and that will hopefully be useful to the person who <laughs> randomly winds up viewing it or the graduate student or scholar who wants to see who the people were that really did all of these things. So that's been our goal is to try to, to create a video record of uh, the people who were active while they are still in a position to contribute to making a video re uh, record. Um, so the program today is a follow up to the big webinar we did about May Day. Uh, Jay Craven is gonna moderate it and I'll be in the background to do some I'll technical stuff um, to unmute people if, they, if they've muted themselves. Um, uh, so you can, the chat is on. Um, we, so you're, you can also communicate <clears throat> with everybody through that or you can uh, if you know how to use chat, you can use the the dinghy, the arrow to uh, where it says two. You can choose uh, everyone, or you can choose a private message to anyone who is in this program, and you can see the participants. Now, to get recognized, um, if you look at reactions at the bottom of your screen, assume if you're on a laptop, it's the bottom of your screen. If you click on reactions, there's a big panel that says raise hand. Um, you click raise hand and that puts uh, a hand on your screen that Jay will see. Um, and uh, if that doesn't work, send me a chat uh, and we'll, I'll try and get you that way and unmute you. Um, we'd like everybody to limit themselves to three minutes because there are already 29 of us. So three minutes by 30 people is an hour and a half. So um, if you can, I'll leave it to Jay now to do the marching orders, but I will, if you go over three minutes, 
Um, there are a variety of unpleasant things I can do, including <laughs> cutting you out entirely. But it's, it's certainly I will let you know if you're going on too long. So, Jay. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I also want to welcome uh, Larry Roberts, who's here, who wrote the new book, uh, May Day 1971, which um, provides fabulous detail and a, a sense of that moment, uh, both in terms of the May Day demonstration and happenings on the street and behind the scenes, but also uh, what was going on inside the White House, uh, also what was going in, on inside on inside the uh, Washington DC Police Department. So um, people may have questions that, uh, or uh, moments of their own that they wanna connect to what Larry has been writing about and what he experienced. And at some point we can ask Larry to tell about his story at May Day because he was also a demonstrator at May Day. Um, and I think that one of the things that is, that's still being sort of you know, thought about is that there were several events during the spring of 1971 that actually really rattled the White House. One of them was the Vietnam Veterans Against the War actions in Washington. Uh, one of them clearly was May Day. Another was clearly the release of the Pentagon Papers. And that, all of that's pretty well documented. And these are events that, that rattled the White House in ways that ultimately did contribute to ending the war. And we can go into more of that if people want to. I mentioned some of it when I spoke at the previous May Day conference. But they also are events that rattled the White House in such a way that began to sow the seeds of Nixon's demise in terms of his moves to start the plumbers uh, and to really overreach in a number of different areas. And so uh, there was impact for sure in terms of how it affected uh, the culture of that administration and its ability to successfully really? rule and carry out its, poli its policies. Anyway, we want to turn this into a conversation. So I would encourage anyone to raise their hand and uh, share some of their own experience and maybe even some thoughts uh, about how it may have impacted them uh, going forward. Howie, I see your hand up, so take off. Oh, wow, well, thank you. That was nice of you. Can you hear me? Yep. So um, I pulled into DC um, with a group, a group from NYU, and um, we slept overnight in West Potomac Park below the Lincoln um, Memorial. Early in the morning, West Potomac Park um, was surrounded by police, and we were told that we would have to get out within a few minutes. Howie, let me stop you a minute. We've got. We're picking up some noise from somebody. Yeah, I don't, so maybe everybody should mute unless you're talking. Is yeah, that, if you, you yeah well, let's do it that way. Everybody mute and raise your hand and then I'll unmute you. Or you can unmute yourself. I'm sorry, go ahead. So we were chased out of West Potomac Park en masse. Um, the NYU people weren't the only mm -hmm. people in West Potomac Park, but we were chased and strangely enough, we ended up in the Lincoln Memorial um, it was all sorts of clatter. We had backpacks on, gas masks on our sides. And my pal, uh, my, my best friend from college said, we're safe here. They're not going to gas us in the Lincoln Memorial. And he was right. We were safe in the Lincoln Memorial. It was the only time I'd been in the Lincoln Memorial. Um, after that, um, we migrated all over Washington, DC. We were chased everywhere by the DC police. We ended up, I think it was Georgetown University, and we sat down at a long table and uh, Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman are sitting at the table and they are going after. It was like a basketball double teaming of a daily news reporter. And Abby was um, making a point of the fact that the uh, daily news never reported facts about the Vietnam War. Just as an aside, I, I had, um, just become a war resistor. Um, I was in the military at the time and I was not interested in getting arrested in DC. Uh, we spent the night in a suburb. That, that's the way revolutions need to be carried out. You always need to go to the suburbs at night. It, it, it makes for a great next day. But um, we did, we stayed at the, the house of someone from NYU and we were really comfortable. We come into DC the next day and we're chased everywhere. 
uh, the most amazing scene, I don't know how close I am to the, the three minutes, but a phalanx of police, we get chased out of George Washington University the next day, we're in the, a cafeteria, a meeting room, an auditorium, whatever it is, um, we, we're chased out, we're told we had to leave, we ended up on a, a residential street and a phalanx of DC police come at loads of us sitting around and rambling around both sides, close in, tear gas starts hitting the ground and we're welcomed into an apartment house um, by a couple of, um, how long? Am I finished? Yeah, 30, give yourself 30 seconds more. Okay, so we go into, we, we're, we're welcome into, we're grabbed in, we're literally grabbed into an apartment house. The police are right at our heels and um, we get into the apartment. There are helicopters in the back of the apartment in the courtyard. They're just above the, the top level of the, um, top level of the apartment building. Um, and we, we had two gas masks. We had to buddy breathe because the tear gas was falling everywhere. The police were all over the apartment house. And at the end, when, when it finally calmed down and the police left, my friend and I decided that it probably would be a good idea, which I was all in favor of, since I had just become a serious resistor, uh, that we would hitchhike back to New York City, which we did. End the story, we get picked up by a couple of kids on 95 going north back toward New York City. And after they heard our story of the mayhem that we experienced, um, the two kids who were, uh, uh, were one driving the car and one a passenger, bought our gas masks because they were absolutely convinced that a revolution was going to happen. Um, in the next couple of days, but the revolution was going on. It was a great experience, um, just amazing, just absolutely amazing. Sheila, are you... Uh... I can't hear Jay. He's muted. I'm not about to shoot myself in the yes. head. Okay, fine. There we go. <laughs> I, I was unable to unmute myself. Anyway, you can go on the participants list. There's a raise hand function there. <clears throat> and, um, you know, you, you can tell your experience of, of being there for a couple minutes, or you can say something else, how you thought it, the impact that it had, or how you perceived it. It doesn't have to be all, you know, the sort of, um, minute by minute. Howie's story is a, a good one with some good humor involved also. Uh, who knows where those gas masks are now. Um, <laughs> Bill Davis uh, has his hand up and let's listen to Bill. <clears throat> Bill? Yeah, he's got on mute. There you go. He's got to unmute also. Yeah. Okay, there. Uh, first of all, uh, as I told the Florida legislature, couple of weeks ago, I don't do anything in three minutes, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, uh, but I'm going to hurry because I know your time is more valuable than mine because I'm only 70. Um, I, uh, I was 19 years old. I worked on it full time. I got full time academic credit of A uh, as uh, writing sociological observations from a participant observer standpoint. Uh, I had a blast. I ran amok. Uh, and my, uh, I, I was re I had to write a journal as part of my academic work of my activities. And I saw my first snowfall when I went up and we had the map spread out and we said, Florida will take DuPont Circle because of the, our romantic interest in it. And then I was able to write about the regional chauvinism and how the people from New York came in to get, they tried to organize us and we were so much better organized and had so many more people there, but we were Southerners. So I wrote about regional chauvinism and, and helped to have the, the uh, sequel, Gathering of the Tribes in Atlanta, which was a tremendous event. I did an interview over there. It was sociologically amazing. I'll only tell one story. Um, I have so many stories to tell. I'm just going to pick one. Um, and uh, and it, so, uh, and I'll, let me, I'll, let me, I'll add, my father passed away on May 5th. 
while I was in DC. And my mother had passed away a couple of years earlier. And the older radicals around my university kind of took me in. And uh, before my dad died, he was not well. And so um, that was my financial circumstances. Were really good, but I didn't know. Anyway, so we, I was organizing full time. We bought buses. We bought we raised a bunch of money with dances and stuff, universities. We bought buses to drive people up. And then um, I was in a car of four on April 30th outside Tampa. And there was one of our buses and we pulled over and the cops were searching it. They arrested the driver, uh, said there was pot. There wasn't. It was planted. So the guy driving my car and I got out. He had a chauffeur's license. He said, I'll drive the bus to Tallahassee and get a new driver. We told our friends, meet us in Tallahassee. We got there, it was after midnight on April 30th. I've been working full time. It was the most meaningful experience in my life up to then and since then. And we didn't meet up and we were stuck there. And Mayday was the next day. So I flew in my first jet flight. Uh, we didn't have any clothes. Ed, my friend Ed was wearing shorts and it was cold. So he borrowed these pants from a, a friend I found from high school in a dorm that were like clown pants. And we found a, an old blanket in the in the a uh, trash can or uh, cigarette place out in the dorm that had a hole burned in it. And we got on the plane with no luggage, the blanket with a hole burned in it and pins all over us. I'm going to finish the story. And so uh, we, we land at the uh, DC airport and, and we walked out and it's a beautiful day. And we start walking down the sidewalk and a limousine pulls up. Now I'm leaving out all the stuff about how the cops treated us in the, in, in the airports and everything. And a limousine pulls up and the window goes down and the guy says, you going to Peace City or whatever? We said, yeah. He says, hop in. And it was a stretch limo. And it was just, the guy turns around. He looks like wavy gravy, some kind of a freak. And he was on his way to pick up Rare Earth or somebody at the air, airport. They didn't show. He was picking up bands. So we rode in. I flew my first jet and I rode into Peace City in a freaking limo. <laughs> Give me these really long, baggy clown pants. And, uh, but other than that, I just want to say uh, that I, I've told people I want on my, uh, at my epitaph, mobile tactics, affinity groups. That's what we learned. That's what worked. Uh, we over-organized. Everything was over-organized. They organized to meet us in military fashion. They defeated us in military fashion. When we broke down into small affinity groups and ran amok, we shut that city down with trash cans and city benches and moving cars out into the street with the, and they couldn't stop us because they, we didn't have a plan. We were disorganized. So they just arrested everybody based on what they looked like. Thank you very much. I went more than three minutes. <laughs> so uh, I've unmuted Dick, Glenn and Walter. Uh, so go ahead, um, Jay, whatever. Okay, uh, this is Dick Berliner, and I, uh, I live in Birmingham, Alabama, but I um, was a Washington, D.C. resident at the time of the march, and in the interest of keeping John's time, I've written out my story, so I will stay on point and, and not go over uh, by more than a few seconds, but uh, I had been living in Vietnam, working in Vietnam for three, uh, over a four-year period, and then came back to DC prior to the May Day March in 71. I went to Vietnam with International Voluntary Services. I worked with the Committee on Responsibility and Dispatch News Service. A dispatch, which had broken the Mili story while I was still in Vietnam, uh, was unique in that its reporters and then in the respective countries spoke the language. And also in the markets that we served, major city papers like San Francisco Chronicle, alternative weeklies like Indianapolis Free Press and news services like Liberation News Service. I had participated in anti-war protests before leaving the States in 66, uh, most notably one with Staunton Lynn in 1965. Um, but May Day 1971 was different. Our goal was to shut down Washington, D.C. and send a strong message to Congress and the President Business as usual was not acceptable. With the goal of disrupting morning commuter traffic, we rose before dawn to start walking 
from our DuPont Circle Brownstone downtown. Barely discernible in the dark were small groups emerging from row houses and apartments heading in the same direction. We knew this event was going to be big. We formed affinity groups as a way to embolden our actions. My group included some well-known voices in the anti-war movement, Noam Chomsky, Fred Brantman, Howard Zinn, and one other person whom I didn't know, Dan Ellsberg. Ellsberg was rather quiet that day. He had recently given the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times, but they had not yet been published. None of us who walked with him that day knew how vastly his world and ours was about to change. Our group's destination was the 14th Street Bridge, where a crowd was already gathering. Suddenly there was movement. Protesters rushed onto the street. Without hesitation, the police began to swing their clubs. Those on the street scattered immediately. At the same time, other police formed a line between the street and the protesters and began to march forward, spraying tear gas. The police did not arrest people at that time. Their goal was simply to herd us to predetermined areas away from critical intersections could, that could be blocked and disrupt traffic. Somehow our affinity group, all except Howard Zinn, escaped the police net. The rest of us ended up near K Street in front of a coffee shop. We went inside and had breakfast, waited until the police had moved the protesters away from the core of the city. If there had been a plan B, we never heard of it <laughs> and we didn't invent one. I continued working with dispatch and lobbying against the war until joining the McGovern campaign in August, 1972. We did no better in Maryland where I worked and no worse than, than McGovern did in the rest of the country. We remember it mainly as a lost cause, but it also helped define a generation, one committed to doing what was right, despite the odds. Thank you, Dick, <laughs> terrific. Um, yes, um, Larry Roberts, would you share your experiences of May Day? <laughs> we need to mute Larry, there we go. Am I unmuted now? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, um, some of you, may, many of you may know, as Jay said, that um, I spent an awful lot of time researching May Day and talking to people and hearing great stories like the, like the ones you all have been, have been telling tonight, uh, you know, so I could put it in this book. Um, when, I, when May Day happened, I was also 19 years old as a college student. And, uh, you know, at the time, it's, it, it's something that's hard to convey to people today, the immense frustration and anger that people who were against the war and, you know, seemed like at the time, vast majority of young people, but I'm not sure it was the majority, um, the frustration of years and years of marching and parading and petitioning and working for different candidates and, you know, trying every method to stop a war that was clearly so, uh, so wrong and so uh, sort of fruitless, um, that when this idea emerged to escalate tactics into mass civil disobedience, uh, it just felt like the right thing to do. And many of us were eager to do something that was beyond, um, you know, just carrying a sign. And uh, it was very attractive, this idea that you, you know, physically put yourself in the way of, uh, you know, a bad idea, a dangerous idea, and try to, you know, change the course of the country. Um, so at the time, I was at a, a, a going to an experimental uh, sort of hippie college up in New Hampshire called Franconia. Uh, you know, my friends and I piled into a, you know, Volkswagen bus, um, drove down to D.C., and uh, we didn't stay at West Potomac Park. We were in... Um, uh, staying in some of the dorms at George Washington University where many of my friends were still students. Uh, and the day of, we were assigned to one of the circles. I think it was Washington Circle, although I'm not 100% sure. Uh, we blocked, tried to block traffic. We did block traffic. We ran. We were tear gas like everybody else was. Uh, and then it was later in the day, hours later, when the police um, decided to do a, a dragnet uh, you know, the unconstitutional dragnet of arresting everybody who looked like 
they had long hair, and hippie clothes. Um, that was when I was taken. I was just walking down the street and uh, police were just sweeping people up. They grabbed me, put me on a bus. And I, I was one of the ones, I didn't get to go to the RFK stadium or the Coliseum. I was put in one of the uh, police precincts in one of the jail cells that was meant for two people. But, you know, we had, I don't know, 12, 15, maybe more people, more guys in one cell. Wasn't enough room to have more than one person sitting down at a time. So we took turns over about 12 hours. And then ultimately we were released. Um, and, you know, for me, it was something that I always felt, you know, some pride that I took part in this, but I didn't really understand. You know, we all live through these moments and we have a little tiny sliver of understanding of what's going on around us. Um, over the years, I wondered what the bigger picture was, you know, what, what were the police up to? What was Nixon up to? What was the strategy of the movement? How did the tactics really play out? What was behind Rennie Davis's, uh, you know, organizing? Um, so that's when I started some years ago, deciding that uh, this story really needed to be told in a way that was more of a 360 degree, um, you know, look. And that's why I talked to people in, in, in the administration and research their papers and listen to the Nixon tapes um, and, uh, you know, found out for sure what everyone had, we all had suspected at the time that Nixon was behind it. But you may remember that at the time he denied uh, having any role and said that all the decisions about the mass arrest, which of course were all unconstitutional, he said the decisions were made by the Washington Police Department. And, you know, I spent some time interviewing the uh, chief of police who's still around uh, in his 90s um, and reconstructed what, what really went down and, you know, listened to tapes and found transcripts that proved that, you know, there was a, it was the orders of the, of the president. And as Jay said so eloquently at the beginning, um, you know, this was just sort of, to my mind, being able to bend or break the constitution in this way um, was their first sort of cover up and, their, and, and sort of launched them into this idea that they could operate with impunity behind the scenes and do illegal things um, in order to undermine their opponents. So when they turn these same tactics, you know, not mass arrest, but, you know, infiltration, wiretapping, break-ins, uh, you know, to the Democrats, as well as, you know, to the anti-war movement, that was when they all got in trouble. <laughs> So, yes, um, I think we have James Stewart who wants to say something. Let me, yeah, you had background noise, James, so go ahead and unmute it. There you go. Right. Charles, we'll get to you as well. Hi, I'm, I'm Jimmy Stewart, and uh, I was a 17-year-old high school student who grew up outside of D.C. Um, during May Day and, and went down. One thing I want to mention real quick, kind of, you know, Howie had mentioned uh, the people in the apartment building that took them into the, into the apartments um, to, you know, to protect them from the police. And it reminded me that there was a instance during the Black Lives Matter protests here in DC um, last year where a guy opened up his townhouse and took about 50 to 75 protesters that were being chased by the police in and, uh, you know, kept them there all night. Um, you know, and I spent some time down around there and talking with a lot of the, you know, the kids and stuff and, uh, you know, sharing you know, my experiences from May Day in those days and talking with them about what was going on and, and all. And it was, uh, it, re it really was a great, you know, some great experiences. And uh, I got some, got to see some tear gas, breathe some tear gas again for, <laughs> yeah. brought back some of those memories. But uh, like I said, you know, I was 17 at the time in high school and we went down um, got arrested on the sidewalk in DuPont Circle 
<laughs> real quick. Um, you know, and uh, you know, I didn't really get a chance to do anything because the cop said something to me and I said something back to him. And literally the cop said, I don't like the way this guy's talking to me. And the other cop said, take him in. You know, we're not writing anybody up. Take him in. And next thing I knew, I was in the middle of DuPont Circle and, um, and then onto a DC transit bus um, being taken to RFK. Um, and on the way to the bus, on the bus, on the way to RFK, those are the old DC transit buses. Um, and you just head out the bottom of the window and they popped open, you know, it was the emergency exits. And, you know, people were, you know, they, they stop at a red light and next thing you know, people are jumping out the windows <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the people in the neighborhood, it was then a African-American neighborhood and a very poor neighborhood, took all the, took people in, took people in, into their houses. Um, you know, so we had support and all. And I remember, I mean, there was so, so much that happened, you know, some of my things are like, I was just a participant, you know, I wasn't involved with a whole lot of things beyond, you know, getting up in the morning and going down, you know, not just May Day, but, you know, lots of them. Okay, I see you. Um, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and, and it was an experience that, you know, you know I love baby. Anyway, anyway. My time is up, so let me let me stop there. All right. Great. Thank you. Sheila, you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say two quick things. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I was um, the um, <laughs> the brawn at the, or maybe the muscle. Uh, in the legal office for all the demonstrations starting in 69 that went on through, but we were uh, an integral part of May Day. And, um, you know, it was a lot of work before we started. The lawyers didn't come out of the woodwork on their own. Um, I called them and my finger used to be from the dial phone. I had blisters on my finger after calling all the lawyers in DC. But I wanted to say a couple of things quickly. One is that the FBI um, purposefully destroyed our community. And I think people should not forget that in, in the way that, you know, we don't just open our doors to strangers today. We don't have that kind of open heart we had before our communities were destroyed on purpose. The second thing is, is that May Day, the police used, and Tim can talk, Tim Butts can talk to this, I don't know if he wants to, but um, uh, there was the the um, garden plot is the name of the the program they use for the U.S. military to go after the insurgents, aka protesters, and those two things I think are very important in our history. So there you go. Great, Tim Butts, you want to say something? Tim was, was active with the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, also participated in uh, Dewey Canyon 3, but also uh, was around and played a major role in May Day. Um, what Sheila talked about, this garden plot, is kind of a, a controversial and hidden part of the history of the anti-war movement. Um, there is no doubt all these years later, the government had plans in the event of widespread civil disorders uh, to round people up and detain them, put them in camps, whatever you want to call it. Uh, May Day provided them an opportunity to sit back and observe uh, or to war game as they call it, how that might play out in a situation of mass civil disobedience. 
So I'm, I'm not sure that the Army had more than the visible, observable participation that it had. Uh, there were lots of military officers hanging around with uh, police and uh, federal officials and whatnot. But what they got out of May Day was more than an opportunity to put their people in the streets. I think it was an opportunity for them to uh, broaden their understanding of how plans to squash uh, civil disturbances could be put into effect. Um, so that's, I think that's my contribution at this point. Okay, Glenn Risden. Well, I raised my hand with, with, with the idea that perhaps you might be interested in what happened to our little local debacle here in, in, in San Francisco. Of course, it's just a footnote compared to yours. And it was, it was all based on the idea that, that individuals and groups are supposed to uh, research different uh, apparent uh, war profiteers, and then on the day they would send delegations to the to, to them to, 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 to discuss it. And of course, it, it didn't work out the, the the way it had been planned. There was only one one Quaker group was able to to visit one of the corporations. It, there were you know four uh, anti-Vietnam War organizations in the city, and of course the NPAC wasn't wasn't into into this. Uh, so I I, I didn't. I, I, I really wasn't up to the task, uh, uh, but early that morning around seven to eight, I, I did some, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it militant leafleting in the Bank of America World Headquarters uh, 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 a parking uh, garage entrance. And then I had a little a little scuffle with the rent-a-cop there and the uh, but that they eventually shut the garage down. And I, we, we, have a, we had a downtown office that we, we rented from the redevelopment agency. I went back to the office and, 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 and sort of monitored things from the, from, from, from the office there for a while. I think maybe I went out in the street later on, but there was a great deal. Uh, the, the cops beat up a lot of people and a lot of glass was broken. And, and uh, there's, a, there's an article that, that there was an underground paper that we put out at the time called The Good Times. That it had an account. There's, there's, a, you, 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 there's a website I mentioned in, in, in the, the, the question that you can go to the website. They have some photographs and, and, and references. That they claim there was 300 people were, were arrested. And that this kind of was, was the beginning of the, of, of the end of this particular uh, downtown peace coalition that, 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 that I was involved with. So I don't know if you have any other regional activities that, that, that you mm -hmm. that, that you have covered, but yeah. as a footnote, I'm cool. bring this up. It's good to know about. Uh, Walter Teague has had his hand up for a while. Charles has had his hand up for a while, but we'll keep we'll get to everybody. Walter. Yeah. Walter, um, actually, I just tracked down the May Day film thanks to Walter. There, there was a picture we made that was used to organize the demonstrations, mobilize people to come to Washington. And Walter had a 16 millimeter print of this film and we digitized it. It's now available, I believe, online through VPCC, or if not, I can provide a link to people. Walter. Yeah, thanks. Um, I want to add one point I think that needs to be emphasized more. Uh, if we look at the development of the demonstration, uh, a lot was going on and it began, in, in my view, with the recognition among pacifists and political groups that they had to work together and develop a strategy. And certainly May Day was, was the result of a strategy that was very effective. Now, the part that I think is underestimated is how much, how seriously the government, including the military and the civilian parts, took the potential of the demonstration. Because I think they thought if it was not diminished or uh, somehow interfered with, that it could be bigger than Woodstock. And, it, and if we remember that the, it was supposed to begin with three days or two or three days of music and so forth. And, and 
tens of thousands of people were coming. It was advertised on rock shows and, you know, newscasters and so forth were giving it a, a positive review ahead of time. And then something strange happened. Uh, a few of the uh, DJs who've been promoting it suddenly got anxious and said they'd heard that there was uh, somehow association with bombers and so forth. And I've, I've heard, I haven't seen the evidence yet, that there were letters sent, anonymous letters sent that could have been by the FBI or whatever to get the DJs to cut the support. So th what happened was the first day music then there was the breakup when the police came the next morning and the, the roads were full of young people hitchhiking, scared, of course, leaving town. Nonetheless, there was a huge number enough that, you know, 12, 13,000 people could be arrested. Now, I personally know that police and undercover agents were involved in some of the arrests because I, my group, uh, Affinity Group, was trying to help support the setup of a uh, citizen band broadcast station for the medical groups that were in DuPont Circle. And we found a, a good antenna in the 2000 P Street building. And suddenly we were broken into by a whole bunch of guys in plain clothes with identical long brand new billy clubs. Um, and I was arrested by name, which is unusual. The cop, you know, a cop shaking in fear, I don't know what of what, came up to me and, and called my name and arrested me and, uh, and, a, and a, another person I was working with. So I, I think a lot of other things, the, the prior arrests of Le Leslie Bacon, a lot of other things were going on that have not been fully brought out. But th my point is that this was, a, it was a growing movement, not just for May Day, but there were political groups becoming more radical across the country, the public was turning against it more. So I think the strategy was brilliant. I think whatever we did individually was good, but the overall was that finally, it was like a resistance movement was trying to find a way to be more effective. And I think, I think it was. Right. Good, absolutely. And I, you were in the middle of it. Let's go to Charles and then Bob Levering. Huh. Let me just share uh, what actually happened on the first day that my wife and I were walking really uh, from, I think it was around Thomas Circle. Well, we were living in Texas then. I think the South was uh, a church near Thomas Circle when we were dispersed that morning. Uh, we were walking and uh, there was a, a young lady uh, being arrested by uh, two police officers and she was holding her baby. And this was on the sidewalk, concrete and whatever. And, and it, she was swinging around and the baby looked like she was gonna drop the baby or the police officers, were what they were going to do. They were still trying to arrest her. And uh, so we jumped in. And of all things, I ended up with the baby. <laughs> and, so, and so they took her off and then Two police officers, I guess there were four involved. The other two police officers, uh, we followed, my wife Pauline and I followed with the baby, following the other patrol car and gave the baby back to the mother. I mean, it was that, I thought that day, that first day was just so chaotic. People with their, uh, the police with their motor scooters driving on the, the sidewalk, trying to run you over. It, it was... Uh, it was an incredible experience. But I think about that baby. That baby is 50 years old now and could easily have died uh, if that baby had fallen uh, on the concrete. Interesting. Okay. One more notch in the, in the belt of all, all that happened. At May, we, things that nobody ever heard of um, happening as we spoke and as we acted. Bob Levering. Yes. Uh... Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep, okay. Uh, I was uh, one of the organizers for the uh, People's Lobby, which was the week of civil disobedience before the May Day actions. And one of the things that Walter said, I think is true, is that we did have a pretty good 
there, there was actually a lot of uh, cooperation of the different elements of the anti-war movement during that period. That, uh, that, and part of it was the PCPJ and NPAC cooperated with the big uh, demonstration on April 24th. And then PCPJ alone uh, helped to sponsor, you know, the People's Lobby and then the, uh, uh, the May Day actions. Now the People's Lobby, there were about a thousand people uh, arrested at the different locations that we picked. We did have, I think Jay said that he had participated in actually going into Congress and doing some lobbying in Congress was part of it. But then there were civil disobedience actions that the uh, Selective Service, the HEW, and Department of Justice, and I can't remember what was, oh yeah, the IRS, but you're on, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, that, you know, and it was pretty much exactly what we wanted in our, uh, I, and I noticed one of the other organizers with me was Chris Meyer, who's uh, here uh, in his orange shirt. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we, uh, it pretty much, you know, we were very, very happy with the way in which that week was, uh, you know, that we were able to con conduct it and, you know, and all of them were nonviolent uh, civil disobedience actions. Uh, as I said, there were about, you know, several hundred each day for the, those four days. Um, I know that I just said, okay, on the last day, which was the Department of Justice day, I said, okay, well, I've done my organizing work. I'm just going to go jump in. And so I was arrested there and got a good experience with my uh, nonviolent training, which I'd done a lot of, which was, uh, you know, when, when I got uh, picked up by one of the cops, you know, and he sort of threw me away when I came back. So I did that a couple times where they got frustrated and actually put me in the paddy wagon. I don't have much of a recollection of the jail experience, but I do remember on Monday morning, because I went out again, you know, with the, the masses of people that were involved in trying to uh, shut down DC and I was arrested early, uh, you know, with my affinity group. And I know it was near the Department of Agriculture. And, um, and I was uh, like Larry was in was put into one of the jail cells. And there were, uh, I think, I think there were 19 in a two person cell, which was really awful for uh, uh, you know, that, I don't know, it was 18 hours or something like that that uh, I was in. And, um, you know, as a, uh, and, and the, one of the two things that I specifically remember was one was um, as, as a vegetarian that the only thing they had was this bologna sandwich that was the only food we got during that entire period of time. And, you know, so I gave my bologna to somebody else. He ate this <coughs> white bread with some god awful mayonnaise was what I had for sustenance. But anyway, and the other thing was that it just so happened that there was an, another person in that cell was, if there was anybody I really had problems with, it was him. So it was like by chance, he was arrested by DuPont Circle and I was arrested in another part of town. So I had, you know, this very uncomfortable relationship with somebody you know, in this, this uh, compressed space. Uh, we didn't re reconcile, but we did uh, uh, manage to survive together. Yeah, I think that the People's Lobby has been in some ways overlooked in a lot of the accounts of May Day. And, and by, in some ways, by having civil disobedience at a small, at a smaller, very focused level the week before May Day, I think actually sort of, you know, conditioned the public in a funny way to the, the, the more militant civil disobedience of the following week. And it, and it sort of built a momentum, which is... If you're ever a storyteller or a filmmaker, you're always trying to figure out how to intensify the narrative. Well, I think that the certainly the Vietnam veterans actions, Dewey Canyon, the, the, the big demonstration of hundreds of thousands of people uh, on Saturday, I think it was the 24th, that just it didn't stop. And so the, the whole period of time really uh, built momentum in a way that um, 
you know, certainly paved the way for May Day, but also each, in, in, each event had its own character. And I would argue that nothing really had been seen like the Vietnam Veterans Actions. Um, maybe Tim would later on t mention that, talk about it again, because he was all, you were also involved with Dewey Canyon 3, weren't you, Tim? Yeah. Eddie Becker, how about you? You want to say something? You and Joni, you or Joni, both of you, whatever. Because you guys were on the streets with video cameras. This is at the very first moment that porta pack portable video recording was possible. And they had a whole army of people out on the streets and they've made a movie that Eddie can tell you about Raw May Day that's been circulating a lot this spring. I think we had about uh, 20, 20 or 30 people eight porta packs on the street. Most of them were arrested. Lots of footage from inside of the jail, inside of the stadium. Uh, Joni filmed the women's march. We had uh, coverage in, uh, extraordinary coverage of the, of the police violence and uh, of the civil disobedience. And uh, Skip Blumberg from the Video Freaks has recently re-edited and incorporated a lot of new footage, not a lot of new footage, stuff we hadn't, uh, already included in the original edit. And uh, I posted a link to it in the chat so you can all go and see it. Cool, absolutely. Joni, anything you wanna add there? No? Uh, yeah, it was really fun. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, uh, we have uh, Chris Meyer wants to say something. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this this will add a little levity and bring us into the current day. About ten years ago, I went to get my uh, global traveler passport card, and you have to go for an interview uh, in person. And for me, it was at San Francisco Airport. And one of the questions they ask you is, have you ever been arrested? And they're looking at a screen and I can see the guy's eyes rolling up and down. And finally he looks over and says, what the hell were you doing? And because there were several arrests from that period. And I mentioned some of the things, including as Bob just mentioned, uh, the people's lobby. And you're in an environment with everyone as a customs person with all their uniforms, et cetera. And the next person over who's just eavesdropping, eavesdropping in his uniform, big burly guy turns to me and says, thank you for your service. Uh, after I described why I was arrested. And uh, that was one of the most nice acknowledgements of the impact we had had that I was not aware of. So that's a tidbit from the present of what we did. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Tim Butts, you want to talk a little bit about uh, Dewey Canyon, how you saw it connecting to May Day and what, what, uh, how you saw that whole period of the spring offensive. Is Tim, he's not yeah, unmuted. Yeah, there we go. There we okay. go. Um, so Dewey Canyon 3 was born out of something called the Winter Soldier Investigation. And I was one of the organizers of, of the Winter Soldier Investigation. And that was an inquiry into American war crimes in Vietnam, as told by the personal accounts of Vietnam veterans. It was held in Detroit. Uh, it got very, very little press coverage uh, outside of the alternative press. But at the end of it, uh, American forces uh, once again were on the march and there was an invasion of Laos. And we probably had 600 or so Vietnam vets at the, uh, the hearing. Not all of them testified about war crimes, but a good number did. And that group demanded that VVAW march on Washington. We had never done that before. 
uh, the biggest march we've ever had was a four-day march from Valley Forge or from uh, uh, someplace in Pennsylvania, I can't remember where, to, to Valley Forge. It was called uh, Operation Raw, which stood for Rapid American Withdrawal. Um, so we come to uh, the point where we're going to go to to Washington, D.C., and I was sent there where I hooked up with uh, Mike Phelan and Jack Mallory, and we were kind of the organizing cadre for all the behind-the-scenes work that goes into uh, having a, a large demonstration like that, and our National Steering Committee decided that we would camp on the mall, that we would engage in guerrilla theater, which was a big part of what we had done with Operation Raw. Um, and uh, it all, it, it's all a blur in many ways, um, but we got it done. Uh, we got it done notwithstanding police infiltration by the Metropolitan Police Department and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. Uh, probably some FBI informants in there too, who knows. Uh, and it culminated, of course, after much change. I think the two highlights that I have of Dewey Canyon 3 were the day that the Supreme Court ordered us to vacate the mall and we refused to do so. And we had an arrest plan. Everybody knew what to do when they were arrested. And uh, the cast of hair, which was, hair was playing in DC at the time. Uh, when we were facing arrest, the cast of hair came down and did a performance for us. And there are a thousand or so uh, vets camping on the mall. So that was kind of a highlight simply because of the inspiration that musicians gave to us. Uh, the second big thing was the throwing away of the medals. Um, a very powerful statement, never been done before. Uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. But following that, uh, or during all this thing, of course, there's negotiations going on between PCPJ, NPAC, and VVAW is kind of sitting in as an observer on that. And the VVAW steering committee decided that we would not take part in May Day or the People's Lobby as a group, but our individual members could participate, of course, if they wanted to. And I think a significant number of them stayed. Uh, when we broke camp and went home on the 23rd of April, uh, who knew how many were gonna stay? There was no idea, nobody took a head count or anything. I personally missed the April 24th demonstration because I was just exhausted from all the work that had gone on. And, you know, during that week, I probably didn't get more than a few hours sleep every night. Uh, but Sunday, you know, I went down to the PCPJ office to, to help out. And that's when uh, the cops went into uh, the camp and broke things up. And there was a lot of chaos and confusion there as all of you know, but I think what the value of DVAW and Operation Dewey Canyon 3 was to grab the attention of the American public and help to legitimize the demand for ending the war, which made, which I think gathered more support for May Day. Uh, Absolutely. I don't think there's any question about that. And uh, it was the critical mass. It was the right thing at the right time. I was speaking to somebody earlier today 
about the people who are active in politics, even establishment politics, how many of them truly understand the moment? You know, and, it, and, and it's never been more important than right now. But Vietnam veterans against the war understood the moment perfectly. And yes, it absolutely opened the door. One thing to remember too, is that May Day, people say, well, you know, it was irresponsible, it was this, it was that. And, but you know, it also fed very directly from the national student strike the previous spring, where there was a lot of frustration that came out of that, that simply a march was not sufficient to uh, express how it was that people felt. There was also a whole new post SDS generation that was in motion. And, uh, you know, so you had a lot of ascending forces at this particular moment. The Vietnam Veterans Against the War was definitely very big uh, element in that moment. You also had this younger generation of, of post student strike, invasion of Cambodia, Kent State, Jackson State, all of that previous spring, there was a lot of pent up energy that was able to also uh, make itself known. Tim mentioned a number of uh, infiltrators that happened. Uh, and one of the things about Larry's book is that he, uh, ident he works with John O'Connor, who I'm sure you remember Tim, who was <laughs> infiltrating the Vietnam veterans against the war at that time. Actually, Jack Mallory and I attended the May Day reunion at the Harrington Hotel and uh, John was invited to join us and did. Um, John was an interesting case and case study in uh, what it means to be an undercover cop. Uh, John was assigned to, he was working for PCPJ when uh, it, the decision was made to do Dewey Canyon 3. And he was, uh, he, he eventually, you know, he was an Air Force veteran. He, he became friends with us and uh, he, he, uh, was told to get as close to us as he could. And he did that not only through the May Day demonstrations and months and months afterwards, but finally, one day he had a, a realization that what he was doing was wrong. And he went into his boss and threw his badge on the, the desk and saying, I quit. And, uh, you know, these guys aren't dangerous. That's great. great. They're, I was with Carmen. Right? The, there's uh, no reason for me to be it's infiltrating true. them. You know, they're they're not going to blow up anything. They just committed to stopping. Them. And his boss convinced him to keep, stay in the police department. And he became a... Uh, a patrol officer after going through the academy. He was plucked from the academy to to do his work with uh, PCPJ or with NPAC. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. I think, a, I think Howie wanted to be recognized. Yes, too. absolutely. Yeah. Can Howie. you hear me? Am I coming? Yeah. We can got you. Fine. Um, I think a, a, a lot of people are. Um, getting uh, close to what Mario Savio said during the Berkeley free speech movement, when it becomes so odious, when the operation of the system becomes so odious that you're ready to put yourself uh, onto the gears of the machine, hundreds of thousands of us did. And, you know, we're, we're sort of living testament to the fact that we stopped the mayhem, we stopped the murder. Um, they could not continue anymore. Um, by first turning to a Nixon, turning to an all volunteer force. And then finally, they just couldn't conduct the war anymore. Um, Fraggings, ah. you know, mass demonstrations. So we were the critical mass and we stopped the, uh, we stopped the, um, the bloodshed. We stopped the mass murder. One of the questions that has not come up here, which we're interested in is whether May Day, it's often described as the last of the demonstration mode of, of anti-war opposition. And, and that after that, people shifted very much into a legislative focus of uh, successfully working to end the funding for the war. Um, and we don't know whether that's the same people, what happened to May Day people? Did they having been through this intense experience, 
was did they then go back and do local anti-war work? Were they involved with Indochina peace campaign or through other ways, the Quakers or other ways to work on on the legislation that ultimately ended the war? Um, it's you know as as VPCC thinks about what it ought to be focused on in the next couple of years between now and 25. Um, this question of what happened to people um, becomes important, I think. Yeah, I mean, I know, I mean, uh, well, Larry Roberts, of course, became a journalist. I think Sheila has her hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was Sheila. just going to say, I, oh, sorry, Jay, go on. Go ahead. No, I was going to just point out a couple of people. John, uh, Steve Early was on here before. He's not on now, but he came up, became a very active labor organizer, really has played an important national role in labor organizing. But Sheila, go ahead. What I was just going to say is I stayed in D.C. until about 85. <laughs> and I, um, I became a private investigator and did a lot of criminal defense work as a means of supporting myself. But I also held the... Um, the, the American Indian movement became very active. I held the, um, the, uh, the shamans or the, the, met, the, um, the healers. I held their licenses because they carried peyote and they could be arrested. They, we did, there was a lot of anti-prison work that was done, a lot of welfare rights work that was done. So I would say the anti-war movement, I don't remember any other big anti-war movement things that happened, but you know, there was a joke at some point you go to the police department to get, to get, a, a, <laughs> to get a permit, you get Sheila's phone number. And to some degree that was true. Um, but I just wanted to say that people were very, very active. And you know, the anti-war movement, I won't say it made me the woman I am today, but I had a very, uh, a fantastic uh, practice as a private investigator, both in DC and in um, San Francisco, um, directly as a result of my anti-war, you know, and my prison work and my death penalty. I mean, I learned a lot. I came knowing nothing, I was a kid, and I learned a whole world of things. Yeah, Dick Berliner, he, he's not unmuted, he needs to be unmuted. I just unmuted Joe Volk in the hopes that we can bring him into this conversation. Sure. Too. sure. Yeah. Well, there we go. There we go. Okay. okay I'm unmuted. Yeah. Oh, Dick. Okay. Uh, Dick, we'll go to Joe next. All right. So Clay, Dick, that was go ahead exactly the path I took. Uh, you know, I worked with dispatcher. Okay. Just quickly, uh, that was exactly the path I took. I worked for dispatch for a couple of years and then the McGovern campaign came along and I decided that I, I couldn't be political even though the cause was right as a newspaper person. <laughs> I didn't know about Fox News at the time, but I joined McGovern and then I just became a, a lobbyist on Capitol Hill uh, for a variety of issues. The war was still the main a uh, funding challenge that was cutting out all the other good causes. And, uh, and so I was there in the House when they finally voted to cut off funding. But uh, the war continued for me up until Nixon's resignation in 1974. But a lot of my colleagues did become very active. It stayed active. May Day was just a catalyst to keep us going. And it was a a reaffirmation that the support was there to cut off the funding. And I did get arrested six months later in another demonstration in Washington. So there were some more actions, nothing on that scale. But uh, when you look at all the movements that uh, have been made, it grew out of that, uh, it's amazing. Very good. So challenge <laughs> All right, uh, be careful if you have sound going on in your, in your background. Um, Joe, Volk. Well, good evening and thanks. Um, the topic really is the uh, May Day 71 and I didn't have much to do with that, though I watched it and I, I knew what was going on. I had been a veteran, uh, you, uh, 67 to 69, 
I had gone into the military to try to organize guys who refused to go to Vietnam. Uh, when my unit, uh, A Troop 4th and 12th Cap, was sent to Vietnam, I refused to go uh, and took whatever the consequences were, and they really weren't all that bad. Um, uh, but uh, shortly after May Day, hardly a year later, I found myself working with uh, Robert Levering and uh, David Hartzell and my wife, Beth Volk, organizing uh, canoe block, nonviolent canoe blockades of aircraft carriers going to Vietnam. And uh, I felt that there was a, an important interaction between street action and actions like the nonviolent direct actions to stop um, uh, munitions and uh, aircraft carriers from going and the lobbying work that they all work together. And uh, the more action you had uh, out in the streets, the more action you had um, on, the, on the military itself, the more effective the lobbying could be in Washington. And I, I think that that's an important interaction that often is lost. I just uh, put some bio in. Joe went from the military to be peace secretary at AFSC and my boss for a while, and then he headed the Friends Committee on National Legislation for many years. So um, he is certainly one of the people whose path was <laughs> defined by his Vietnam experience. So. Absolutely, yeah. And I, and I learned an awful lot from John McCullough about both politics and movements and Indochina and Vietnam and so on, yeah. In my case, uh, I actually stuck it out in the anti-war movement um, where a lot of my friends went back to Boston and was active throughout the uh, uh, 1972 conventions in Miami, which were sort of anticlimactic. And that's a whole other conversation that we don't need to get into. Um, I also worked on the John Lennon uh, project, which came and went in uh, within a couple of months between December of 1971 and uh, February of 1972, where John uh, had indicated to Jerry Rubin and Rennie and um, Stu Albert and I also worked on that project to put together rock and roll concerts three nights a week during the uh, period of uh, January, February of 1972 through the election to focus on the end of the war and getting rid of Nixon. Now Nixon got wind of it and it was closed off pretty quickly after one concert in Ann Arbor, Michigan to support John Sinclair who, who performed there. And um, the, you know, the demonstration in Miami didn't amount to much. After that, I sort of spent a couple of years in New York and ended up landing in Vermont, wanting to go to a place where I felt I could be involved in sort of community work. And I started teaching at an alternative high school, got involved in sort of activism around the arts and also making films. And that's sort of what I've been doing since then. And my arts work included bringing in San Francisco Mime Troupe, Inti Lamani, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary, uh, uh, Arlo Guthrie, also, you know, uh, Apple Fugards, Master Harold and the Boys. Anyway, so the arts program that I built was very much based on the idea of um, trying to bring progressive cultural expression into rural communities in Northern New England. So there's no question that my approach, my film and arts work uh, from the activist uh, uh, work that I had done for May Day. It was very much one thing leading to another. So it definitely influenced what I did. Uh, anybody else? We have probably another 12 or 15 minutes. Uh, if anybody has not spoken and would like to, please use the raise hand function. Um, Ed Meek. Okay, I got a, where are you? Is Ed here? Yeah. There we oh, go. There you are. Okay. Sorry. It's sometimes hard to find people on the screen. Uh, there you go. Whoops. So now I'm unmuted. <laughs> uh, I'm, I have a chat here. I was going to put up if it will come up because uh, this discussion about the aftermath of May Day kind of caught my attention. So if you look at this chat, the after May Day, Michael Lerner, those of you that know Michael Lerner, put out uh, 
Rampart's article about uh, forming a new American movement. And several of us were involved in that. I think John McGough might say something himself about it. I'm kind of curious of others, because uh, out of uh, this whole effort became an organization called New American Movement that then merged with, with the Democratic Socialists of America that's now been gaining quite a bit of recognition, if you've noticed, uh, kind of Bernie Sanders type. But I'm just kind of curious if people have had this experience that I did where your personal became political, uh, you managed to put off family and partnering for several years, you may have focused on political organizing and running organizations, both local and national, but how did this, was this an imbalance in other people's lives is kind of a question I thought I'd raise in this group. Good. Thanks a bunch. Good question. Absolutely. Um, anybody want to comment on that? Um, it, it majorly disrupted my life, I can tell you that, but I don't need to go into all the details. But uh, um, anybody else want to weigh in on that? I mean, how the, you know, commitment to the movement was frequently disruptive. You didn't make much money doing it. That's one thing. Uh, but it was also a time when you could live very cheaply. You know, I can remember buying a car for 50 bucks and paying $75 a month rent, which made it made it possible for me to get by on very little. But, uh, and, you know, that's a whole interesting area just to explore this question of people that were politically active and how it affected their lifestyle, their relationships, what they what decisions they made about where they would be or what they would do. Um, Eddie Becker, yeah. Oops. That's the, sorry, looking at the wrong one. Eddie, yeah, Eddie's got two. There we go. You got him? Where, yeah, no, I have to, oh, there he is. Whoops. It, for some reason, it, people's positions on the screen change. Yeah. Somebody yeah, goes, go. right. oh, can you hear me now? Go ahead. Can you hear me now? So, yeah, my, my life was really impacted because because I went along with the People's Peace Treaty and declared my self at peace with the Vietnamese people. And when my unlucky number, lucky number came up, I, uh, I refused induction into the military. And had, uh, I'd, been, I'd been working in Italy. And after a few years, I uh, decided to return back to the States and was, was sentenced to uh, two years. But by then things had already, you know, they were all, already sending the water buggers into jail. So they didn't want to mix me in with it. So I got a suspended sentence. And then from there, spent most of my time uh, doing research on other conflicts that the U.S. got involved with. So I, I'd gotten involved in researching on, on Chile and then Central America and uh, all sorts of different intrigues. And, and, uh, and so I, 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 I did both documentation with textural documents, helping people reconstruct uh, the histories for documentaries, as well as going in the streets with with video cameras and documenting events, still in uh, uh, kind of involved in uh, uh, Central American documentation. And then uh, I remember the IMF World Bank in 2000. We put together another collective videotape, breaking the bank, and. Uh, and even more recently, I was at the, the insurgency at the Capitol, January 6th, and made a, uh, a documentary about that. Very different, very different experience. I'm sure. I mean, I think our experience was based on, uh, you know, the, 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 the civil rights movement, civil disobedience and all of that. And their movement may have been based a little more on like uh, the Ku Klux Klan and uh, and uh, the anti-abortion movement, a very different approach to uh how they saw the government and what to do about it. I'll post uh, a link if I have time. Yeah, to my YouTube you, channel. If, you, if you don't get it, yeah, put it on the chat. I wanted to say that we will, um, as I say, we'll let you know as soon as this is on YouTube. Also, we'll take the chat and we'll post it on the page where the bios and the resources are and the little uh, bits of personal experience that people have sent us and you know there's you can use that comment box to to add your own uh, personal experiences um, 
there is an incredible uh, civil rights movement website uh, that has collected people's stories and is visited by thousands and thousands of students. Um, and I just wish that we would somehow be able to create a similar uh, website for the anti-war movement that would have that kind of uh, diversity, breadth, and uh, audience. So, yeah, uh, Larry Roberts actually has uh, posts uh, Mayday stories. People uh, go on his site and and share their stories, and I think that's still a place that you can go. And and anybody who's been here, uh, that would be a great idea. Grace, do we see you wanting to say something down there? Yes. Grace Mischler. Okay, let me. Wait a minute, hold on, just a sec. We're not quite unmuted there. Uh, John, you got her? Yeah, I got her. She's got up. <laughs> she has to unmute herself now. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Um, <clears throat> I was at the Mennonite Seminary during that time you're talking about, and I did go with a group of uh, uh, people that were very involved in Partly Day Coffee House. It was a, a, a place that the police often did not enjoy us doing. We'd have music and that's where we did the artsy stuff. And I have to say that I was really influenced by Murray Hebert. Some of you might know Murray Hebert and uh, Gene Stolfus. Does those names sound familiar? Yep. <laughs> well, anyhow, um, and I, I would always hear those stories, what's going on in Vietnam. And then what, what links me to you guys is that you, it's, your, it's your stories that influenced me to go to Vietnam in 2000. And I was there from 2000 to 2019 through wow. the Church of the Brethren Global Mission Service. And I was based at National Vietnam University in Ho Chi Minh City uh, as a social worker. And um, the, the last four years, I uh, interfaced myself with uh, Children's Hospital One uh, they were having problems with premature babies going blind. And so uh, we now have that operation going. Uh, it's to help the uh, ethnic minorities in the Central Highland areas uh, to make sure the families have transportation, accommodations to come into Ho Chi Minh City, the big city, <laughs> you know. And so I just, I learned from you guys, from y'all to be where I'm today. <laughs> Do you know Doug Hostetter? Yes. Yes, of course, Doug Hostetter also came out of Mennonite missionary work and uh, has right. been active. Uh, There's uh, Luke Martin, Earl Martin. Uh, Jerry Keener was my country director from 2000 to 2009, and he was in MCC before 75. One, oh. of, the, one of the programs that we have in mind and doing sometime in the next year is something that focuses on the work that was done in Vietnam humanitarian work by the Quakers and Mennonites, Church World Service, Vietnam Christian Service and so on, and IVS, and also the humanitarian aid that was sent by American institute organizations to North Vietnam. Um, and, uh, yep. you know, there's many, there's many pieces we still want to get in between now and 2025, and that's certainly one of them. Another is about the, that we'll be doing uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be on the 50th anniversary of the Pentagon Papers release. Um, you should have already seen that link, but if you look in the last newsletter, you can get it. And then sometime in July, um, is Bob Levering still on? There's, um, yeah, he's, the, well, he's, his name is there. Um, we're working with Bob to create a program about the draft in a contemporary sense because there's now a situation where there will be one legislative effort to include women in the draft and another mm -hmm. legislative effort to end the draft. And there certainly are a lot of people in our part of the world and our movement who think that the draft was actually a good thing because otherwise a forever war goes on and nobody pays any attention to it. So, I mean, it's a complicated 
issue and involves national service discussions too. And I don't know how we'll get it all in, but I think uh, that will be, this is Bob's initiative, uh, Robert's initiative. And I think it's, it's gonna be a very interesting program to, to pull together. Uh, and then Paul Lauder is working on a program on uh, the Catholic resistance, not entirely Catholic, but the people who did uh, things like the Camden and other actions that were on the other side of the law. And sometimes people were very public and civil disobedient about it. And other times they managed to stay undetected until 30 years later, they somebody wrote a book about them. <laughs> Right. So it's, uh, you know, it is, a, I, we're going to wrap up right now. We Yeah, let's, let's try to, we have Ed Meek, Walter Teague, both are, have had their hands up for a while. Let's try to get them in and then we'll slip out of here. Okay. Ed, let me just, we got you unmuted. Oh, he's yeah. unmuted. You're unmuted, so you have to unmute yourself. Oh, no, I'm sorry, he is muted. Just, You're muted. You now you should be able to unmute. There you go. Oops. This is so tricky. I click and then you click, so we don't always get in sync. <laughs> um, I was going to do, ask two things. No one has mentioned the FBI break-ins in Media Pennsylvania that went on in March 71. All this is going on. The Pentagon Papers are being released. I don't know if any of you recall that. Keith Forsyth was at the, uh, I think he was at one the convention back, you know, the conference that was two or three years ago. I don't haven't seen him on here since, but that was uh, one thing going on. And that was an important part of what was going on during that period. It didn't come forward until years later when people found out what the source of all that was, but it had an important impact, if you all recall. The second thing I was going to show you, I couldn't figure out where to fit this, but it looks like I can share are you seeing what I put up here on the screen? Yeah. 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 Uh, they rest. Sometimes people have asked me what uh, uh, this photograph is a picture of me in the middle of it here, if you can see the house. <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that. Was uh, taken. I was walking into the Philadelphia 30th Street station. This is sometime after the May Day, of course. And I happened to walk by a newsstand and turned and saw myself looking back at myself and thought, wow, what the heck is going on there? That's cool. <laughs> so wow. I thought I'd interject that since we talked about filming and various things that people have been doing related to, to the event of May Day. That's all. Hey. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. Ed, Walter. Yeah, I, I, I think we should, when we talk about May Day, 71, we should definitely include the fact that many of the people that were involved went on to do really continuing important things politically. Um, you know, I, I got involved in supporting the Vietnamese because I had been a veteran before the Vietnam War on Okinawa. And what I saw how the Okinawans were treated, you know, pushed me to get active. Now, after the war ended, many members of the group that I was with went on to become immigration lawyers, doctors, uh, union organizers and activists. And I, I, while not everybody made it, some of our people died because of the war, but many people went on to do important good things when they finally could get their life together. I became a social worker, retired recently. Uh, I would say a radical social worker. And I think I did a little good even when I got old. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to also note that the May Day tactics also in many ways influenced the next generations of movement activity against the nuclear power on questions of Central America. I know up in Vermont, I was certainly active on all those issues, made a movie in Nicaragua about the literacy crusade. It proliferated, you know, the ACT UP and AIDS activism that happened, uh, World Trade Organization, the, the sort of the increased sort of militancy of May Day, sort of going to the edge of power and staring it straight in the face is something that I think did have an impact going forward. And um, in addition to the many things that people have talked about that they've, they did personally uh, in terms of their work, 
um, I think it continues to resonate. The fact that so many people, even over this 50th anniversary, this is the second event that we've held, have come together to share their experiences, to share their insights. I think Larry's book also puts May Day on the map in a way that it had not been before and has stimulated some reconsideration and refocus. I think younger generations are looking to this period to really try to learn from it. And uh, mm -hmm. everybody coming together here tonight uh, will contribute to that. This information will be publicly available. Uh, Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, you know, should be really applauded for all that they've done in the last several years and are doing very much now to bring some of these voices together and to uh, have them available in one place. Um, there's a saying that Faulkner, uh, uh, William Faulkner wrote that the past is never dead. Um, it's, it's, um, it's not even past, you know. <laughs> And this notion that the past speaks to us contemporaneously, something that I think is powerful to carry with us. And we want to thank everyone here uh, for being a part of that. And you're probably on the VPC mailing list. You'll hear about other programs. Uh, John, any final words you want to share? Just uh, if you want to find these video and film links, they'll, there are already many of them on the page where the bios are. and. Uh, as I say, we'll take the take the chat information uh, and put that on that page. Um, so, uh, you know, this is the second kind of follow up discussion we've had, and I think it's it's a useful idea to do this after some of our big, uh, more impersonal, informational events that give people a chance who were uh, played a part to talk about it. So. Mm -hmm. We'll see you again. Thank, um, thank you, everyone. You, Jay, um, Jay's contribution uh, to VPCC in the last six or eight months has been immense, including if you saw it, the, uh, the video that was made of the reading of Martin Luther King's uh, Beyond Vietnam uh, talk, talk at uh, Riverside Church that that international reading um, Jay created, and uh, it's again on our site, and and we think it's a treasure that that will be useful for many years. Um, I'm saying that because he's pulling back a little bit to do his own film work for the next year, and we won't see him quite as visibly in our work. But I did want to express wow. gratitude for today and his moderating, but also for his contribution and in the last six months so cool. thanks and to everyone all see right you again stay strong see you later right uh